Today is Thursday, the 8th of September, and I am speaking Dr. Bonner of Athens, Georgia. Would you say your first name for me, Dr. Bonner? Well, I'm either William or Bill. Dr. William Bonner. Uh, Dr. Bonner, would you tell me a little bit of your experiences during the era of World War II 50 years ago? I joined the Army as a physician, went to Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania for six weeks where they gave you the initial training and what you were supposed to do as a medical officer. Mm -hmm. From there I was sent to Alliance, Nebraska into a uh, hospital where we had a troop carrier command training group. We had airplanes and gliders that we were training the people to supply by air the troops down field. Uh, I stayed there approximately nine months, joined a troop carrier squadron, went to Louisville, Kentucky, stayed there three months, went to Fort Wayne, Can Indiana, stayed there approximately two months maybe, rode a train, a troop train, across the United States from Fort Wayne to Los Angeles, actually Riverside, California is where we were stationed, and some 50 miles east of Los Angeles, and uh, were preparing there to board a ship to go to India. This was in September of 43, I, 44, I guess, and uh, took us a month to get put aboard ship, took us another month on the ship, some 6,000 troops were on the ship, and uh, we went to Australia, did not get off the ship. The only person who got off the ship was a guy who tr talked a man on the dock. It was his bicycle. He rode through the guards on the bicycle as if he worked there, and he got to see Melbourne, but nobody else on the ship got off. Then we went from Melbourne through the Great Australian Bight, which was a rather rough part of the sea, and uh, took us oh, two or three days to get across there, and then ended up in Bombay. We got off the ship at Bombay and got on a train. It took us a week to get from Bombay to where we were going in India. Do you want the description of the train ride? By all means. I mean, that, that's the <laughs> probably the highlight of my uh, <laughs> army career. Well, I, I imagine those were, were um, bumpy and uncomfortable, am I right? Well, actually we had three different trains. We boarded the train in Bombay and uh, I was a captain by that time in the army and uh, got on the train. Well, it turned out that I was the lowest ranking captain and I had been put in a higher uh, higher uh, degree, better class of the train, but the captain above that was above me had been put on a lower class. So he bumped me and I moved down to uh, part of the train that had just wooden benches. The other one had, had uh, leather benches and you had been more comfortable. But we rode on the train, uh, were fed sea rations and uh, there were all sorts of delicious looking food that the Indians walked up and down the outside the train to try to sell us, but they'd warned us, no, you don't eat any food from the local people. So we just ate our sea rations and wished that we'd had some of the Indian food. We went to the Ganges River. They uh, took us off the train. There was no bridge. And we were, had to take our baggage from the Ganges across the river to get on another train. They again warned us, don't let the Indians take your baggage. They'll walk off with it. But it turned out for a rupee, which was uh, two cents, three cents, you could get a little Indian boy to carry your baggage and uh, watch him pretty closely. So after the first few uh, distances on the, uh, tra on the dock, we let somebody else carry our baggage and paid them a little money. And then when we got on the other side, some more picked it up and took it to the train. 
and uh, it was much easier that way. You had, of course, all you had with you was right there in all this baggage. Uh, got on another train. It was not quite as good a train as the first one. We rode it for two or three days till we got to the Brahmaputra. That's another river. And uh, we had to get off our train, cross on a ferry, get on another train, went to the uh, end of that train. Then we got to get off the train and rode up into the mountains on a third train. That one didn't ride but uh, part of a day and night. The next morning we got to get off the train. They put us on a truck. They drove us into the mountains of India to Imphal, which was up in the province of Assam, and uh, took us 12 hours, I guess, to drive, to ride the 120 miles. We were in the back of a big truck, and uh, but we finally made it. Actually, the third train, they put the doctors together, and I had a pretty good compartment there and a nice place to sleep. <laughs> and. Uh, went to, as I say, Assam and Imphal and set up our camp there. We slept in bamboo bashers and uh, the object of the outfit was to fly supplies to the British troops in Burma who were fighting the Japanese. And at that time the Japanese were in, in we were in pursuit of the Japanese, they were leaving. We, we were winning by this time, and, uh, but they would fly supplies down and I don't know that we ever used gliders. We did use C-46 airplanes and uh, supplies to the British troops. We stayed in Imphal. It was in the uh, middle of the winter, December and January. And of, never, of what year? 1944. Thank you. And uh, we had, as I say, individual, the officers had individual rooms. And uh, although it was uh, winter time, it was not real cold. But uh, at night, it got down to freezing occasionally. And uh, we had, they made some stoves and we burned oil from automobiles in, the, in these stoves. Well, the stoves would burn maybe an hour and there was a terrific amount of soot that would form in the flue. So you'd have to let your fire go out, let the stove cool off, and uh, clean out the soot, and then you could start your fire back and have another hour to an hour and a half fire. So you had a fire from about 8 to 9, 9.30, and then another fire from 10 to 11, then you went to bed. Well, you slept under, as I remember, seven blankets, and you were still <laughs> real cold. But, uh, we, we managed. We had no bathing facilities. Our bathing facilities were uh, using our helmets. We had water, and uh, this is to begin with. We later ended up with some makeshift showers that uh, they had built. We were fed uh, rather good food. I mean, when we got set up, the kitchen got set up, and uh, they used uh, local food, local potatoes, local chicken, called the beef water buffalo, but I'm not sure it was a water buffalo, but that's, that was what they uh, called it. Uh, medically, I had a, three people who were in my detachment to help me, and one of them was a staff sergeant, and one of them was a corporal, and one of them was a private. And uh, to this day, I still get a Christmas card from one of those boys. <laughs> And uh, I still sent him a Christmas card too. And uh, some of the doctors that I knew back in the hospital in Alliance, Nebraska, I still get Christmas cards from some of those families. I mean, we continue to. Uh, Had you already become a doctor before you yes, went overseas? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, w I was a doctor. The war broke out in, of course, 41, and I was a senior. So I had f five months that I finished medical school. Then they gave me a year to do my internship and uh, so that was from 42 to 43 that I, June, July of 42 to June of 43. Then I went into the Army sometime in June of 43 and uh, as I say I spent the summer in Carlisle Barracks. Uh, 
What were your impressions of the China Burma India theater? Was was that a uh, an unusual culture to find yourself in? Oh yes, it was. It was definitely unusual, and certainly I I enjoyed the uh, fact that I was in India and could see the poverty, the way the people lived, the uh, fact that we could get. They let us go to Calcutta, and uh, I went to Calcutta three or four times, and uh, sometimes on business, sometimes just got to go for two or three days of rest and relaxation, and uh, got to go to the picture shows. The picture shows in Calcutta were interesting. I saw uh, Ingrid Bergman in Gaslight, and uh, you, at that time, bought your ticket ahead of time, and you knew where you were going to sit, and uh, went in the afternoon, and uh, the other one I saw was uh, a real interesting story of a pimp there, but I can't tell you which one that was anymore, but uh, it, it, both of them were real outstanding movies, and uh, we, we enjoyed them. Of course, we had movies when we were in camp, and uh, they would do them outdoors with a big screen. And uh, I remember one was Saratoga Trunk. And they kept promising us that we were going to get Saratoga Trunk. But uh, it took them a month, two months, three months, I can't remember. But we finally did end up with Saratoga Trunk. It was a real good movie. It had Ingrid Bergman in it, too. Mm. And, uh, but, uh, Could you read? While you were over there, could you write letters? Oh, yes, yes. Of course, that was another thing that was interesting. As a doctor, and as an officer, you censored the letters that the uh, enlisted men wrote. And you were supposed to read them, and if anything looked like it was wrong, you could say no. But uh, the quality of the letters was really interesting because you, you knew who was the educated one, who was the uneducated one, who was the, I mean, some of the uneducated ones wrote interesting letters, and uh, but some of them copied their letters to their girlfriends out of a book and sent the same letters to two or three girlfriends. <laughs> and uh, but uh, was there material that had to be censored? Not really. I mean, where we were, you see, by the time I got there, we were pretty well winning the war. I mean, it was, it was the tail end of the Burma campaign. We were, we were getting the Japanese all the way almost down to Rangoon. And uh, I never saw any real action. One time the Japanese shot at the airplane and hit the airplane, and I think maybe have injured one or two people. But uh, they were in the flying compartment, flying division of the group. I was in the uh, maintenance our people maintained the airplanes. There were the mechanics who looked after the airplanes, and we furnished the food for the flyers, for the pilots and the airplanes. And uh, they were called, uh, we were called Troop Carrier Squadron, and they were called Flying Squadron, I believe. They didn't use your services as a doctor, or did oh, they? Yeah, oh, yes, 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 oh, yes, yes, oh, yes. I, I was the doctor for, for my squadron. And as I say, I had the three enlisted men who were technicians that, uh, and we, we had sick call, and uh, they were, could come in every morning and give me that story of their illnesses. And uh, if anybody was sick, we, of course at that time, we didn't have a whole lot of medicine. If anybody was really sick, you could send them to the hospital in Calcutta. And uh, sometimes some of the people were mentally Ill, and they had to go to the hospital in Calcutta and were sent home. Uh, were there tropical diseases as well? Skin diseases, heat rashes, and uh, fungus infections. But of course we had medicines that would help them. Because the weather after the winter time got to be later and it was hotter. In the summertime it got, got real hot because the monsoons started in the uh, beginning of May and got worse in June, July, and August. And uh, sometimes the winds were right bad and it blew our houses down. Our houses were makeshift houses made out of bamboo. And uh, they would blow some of them down. 
and they would leak. And we'd, but we always slept, as I remember, in, in uh, with a mosquito net. And you took malaria pills, too. You took uh, Adabrin. That's what you took. And uh, taking it too long sometimes turns you yellow. And, uh, if I asked about some notable notable events of the war and that era, um, say for instance Pearl Harbor, can you recall for me how you heard of the news December 7th of 1941? Interestingly enough, I was going to school in Augusta and we were in Athens on that Sunday and uh, it was a recruiting trip for the fraternity and uh, we heard about it oh, 12 o'clock I guess. and. Uh, then we had to go back to Augusta that afternoon and uh, we were talking about it and knowing about it on the way back because I'm not sure we knew the extent at that time. All we knew is that there had been, there had been a bombing of Pearl Harbor. But as I say, I, I was in Athens from Augusta at the time. Where were you living in Augusta? Were there dorms at the medical college? Or? Actually, we had a fraternity house. And I lived in a fraternity house. What was your fraternity? Theta Kappa Psi, a medical fraternity. And you were recruiting here at this this university campus for, yeah, for we your were, own campus or for here? Or? No, we were recruiting potential students at the medical school. Mm -hmm. We were coming, talking to them, and uh, trying to get them join our, to join our fraternity in Augusta when they came to, to Augusta. Had you gone to school here as an undergraduate? I went one year here, and I did two years at North Georgia College in Dahlonega. Uh -huh. um, where did you grow up? And, and I grew up did you in, tell me about your, your family? I grew up in Livonia, Georgia, which is a small town some 40 miles from here. I have one sister who lives in Athens now, and my mother and father were original Livonia people. Mother taught school, and my father worked for the Southern Cotton Oil Company. And, uh, well, let me take you back to that period of, of military service. Um, you mentioned basic training. Can you describe some of what that was like? Uh, of course, you were, you were <clears throat> with doctors only. And it was a medical field service school is what it was called. And you had classes where they taught you about uh, Army life. They taught you about Army uh, record keeping. They taught you about some army diseases too. I can remember one, we had marches. In fact, we had to go out on marches and uh, some of it they used mock chemical warfare to show us the effects of that and you had to put on your gas mask. And uh, <clears throat> you uh, we went to school though from eight o'clock in the morning to four or five o'clock in the afternoon most interesting thing about it was that I was two hours from New York City, and I got to go to New York City one weekend. <laughs> had you ever uh, been to a, any? Hadn't been to New York City. Like no, not New York. I'd been to Chicago mm -hmm. and been to St. Louis and, and uh, traveled fairly extensively, but we just never had gotten to Washington. I'd been to Washington, D.C., but we'd never gotten to New York City, and so it was interesting to be able to go to New York City and see the things that you could see in not much more than 24 hours. Let me ask you about another notable event, this one, the end of war with Japan and the dropping of the atomic bomb. Do you recall uh, VJ Day in, in that area? Well, the atomic, the atomic bomb, we were in, again, India at the time. And uh, it was August the 10th, I guess, or 11th, 10th, I believe. And, uh, they told us about this episode this happening and because you couldn't fathom what they were really trying to tell you because it sounded so awesome and uh, certainly it turned out to be more so than you even guessed when you when you heard about it and uh, then the war was over and uh, they let us take us then from india into china and we stayed into China September, October, and November. And uh, then we were flying troops, Chinese troops, <clears throat> north to attempt to keep the communists from coming south. 
And that, that was our mission at the time we were in China. You got so many points, and by December the 1st, I was able to start home. Well, that was a long, long deal, too. You want to hear coming home? Certainly, very much so. <laughs> well, we, <clears throat> as I say, we had spent our time in China, and it was an interesting episode there because there was no longer any war, and it was more of a sightseeing tour for me, and uh, I did what little medical work I could do. But uh, one time, I can remember, we had a, had a uh, celebration party and dinner, and uh, being after the war, there was hardly anything to drink, but uh, turned out there was a, we could get a hold of some Dubonnet wine, and uh, had a big party and drank Dubonnet wine all one evening, and uh, got kind of drunk. Another thing that was very interesting in India, they gave you a case of beer a month. Well, you didn't have any, didn't have any uh, way to chill your beer, but you'd drink, you'd try to space it out for that month. And uh, you'd try to make it what You also got some uh, scotch whiskey, but it was the worst whiskey you can possibly imagine. But they gave you that. And uh, uh, oh, back to coming home. Uh, went to Shanghai. And uh, <clears throat> we couldn't get out of Shanghai. I mean, uh, uh, but finally, I mean, that was a two-week stay in Shanghai, and I got to go to two or three plays, Russian operas and Chinese operas, and Russian Russian uh, cafes. There were some of them you could go to. There were several good Chinese cafes that you could go and eat and got really interesting food. Well, uh, around the 1st of December, they... Uh, let me and about six, eight more people get on an airplane, and we started, and we went to Canton. Well, we got to Canton, and uh, we didn't have any way to get out of Canton. So we stayed there for about a week, and uh, didn't have anything to do then. We were no longer looking after any troops. We were just waiting to get out. Finally, somebody got an airplane and got us from Canton to the Philippines. <clears throat> we spent one night in Manila, and then got the, <clears throat> at the time there was a real good airplane that was carrying uh, VIP people around the world. And you had an airplane with seats in it, and uh, so frequently when you rode airplanes, they were just cargo planes, and you just sat on the floor or whatever. But this was a regular, regular airplane. And uh, we got on in Manila and uh, started home. This was now maybe December the 6th or 8th took us from the Philippines to Guam, stopped in Guam and changed, got some gas and gave us some uh, food. From Guam, we flew to Wake. From Wake, we flew to Johnson Island. Johnson Island to Hawaii. Uh, spent an hour and a half in Hawaii, my longest time I've spent in Hawaii. And then went to, flew to San Francisco. Do you think they were refueling at every stop along the way? Oh, oh yeah, your, your plane would go for about eight hours. And uh, so you had to fly eight hours to another island and refuel and get on to the next place. Uh, finally got to San Francisco, and uh, we were staying at some place. I can't remember where we stayed in San Francisco. But you couldn't get a train out. There were so many people coming in, and uh, you couldn't get a train. You wanted to get a train to go from... Uh, San Francisco to Chicago, and uh, but I say in San Francisco till December the 17th or 18th, and had a good time though. I had a friend there, and uh, she would come and we'd go out and eat, and we'd go to the park, and we toured San Francisco and just had a big time. But finally got a uh, train. I had a friend with me, and. Uh, he was a doctor, and uh, they would, they would, they got us a coach, and uh, we got on the coach. Well, he and I had to share an upper berth, and uh, we left, we left San Francisco. It was fine, you left at night, 
but you got to the Sierra Mountains and the windows froze over, and from there to Chicago, you didn't see out a thing. The windows were solid with ice. And your coach that you were on, it was a Pullman coach, but uh, it didn't belong to any one train. Therefore, they would take you to one place, and then the lines, the train line would change, and they wouldn't take our coach. So we'd stay there a while, and then the next train would come along, they'd put us on. And instead of taking about three days to get from San Francisco to Chicago, it took us about five days. But it was now about December the 23rd, and, uh, but when you got to Chicago, you could, you could uh, get a ticket home. And so I got a ticket from Chicago to Atlanta, called my parents, and they picked me up, and I got home on December the 24th for uh, Christmas. Well, that, that was a right long, right long trip. Colin Wallace. Um, uh, home to Livonia then at Christmas mm -hmm. time? Home to Livonia at Christmas time. Yeah, I'd spent one Christmas in uh, India. I had spent one Christmas in Nebraska. And I had spent, I don't know where the other one was. So that would be Christmases of 43, 4, and 5? Uh, 46? No, 45, because I got out of the Army in 46. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what did you think of some characters I'd like to ask about, uh, say, what did you think of President Roosevelt at the time? Because I was a god, you, you accepted whatever he said and whatever he did, and uh, I was in Burma at the time and uh, heard that he had died. but. Uh, at that time, you were. Some of the people went down to Burma to sort of help with the people moving out, and uh, but we were, we were all felt right bad about his death. Did you know anything about his successor, about Harry Truman, at the time? No. Mm -mm. Um, can I ask about uh, Joe Stilwell? Did you? have an opinion of some of those commanders either way? Was he even there at the, at, in, at the latter portion? I think he was in China, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe so. Uh -huh. And uh, our, some of our people did fly uh, from India to hunt, across the hunt to China and carried, carried uh, supplies along the way. But that, that's about all I can say about him. Were there some notable characters who stand out in your memory? Either in in the the army command or the command or or uh, in in the medical corps or, or uh... no, I don't know that I could say any of them were outstanding. I was interested to get back and find that Dean Rusk was the commander of the China Burma India Theater, and uh, at the time I didn't didn't know it, but uh, it was interesting to find out later, and then of course to know Dean Rusk here in town. Yeah. I haven't spoken with him regarding this project, but I may try and do something about it for the month. Yeah, he would, he, would, he would be a smart I, mean, I imagine he's been in here so many times. At any rate, um, you mentioned sea rations. Were there other examples of, of food, unusual food? There was K-rations, uh, K-rations, which were actually better than sea rations. And, uh, but uh, I'm trying to think where we ate sea rations. Besides on the train, but somewhere else. First time I had instant coffee it was the Nescafe. <laughs> it was was kinda, that a part of your ration? That was part of your ration. Yeah, you got you got some cheese in a can. You got some a little can of uh, coffee, and uh, you got uh, crackers. And uh, I'm not sure what else was in C rations. Was it unusual? K rations. K rations. Was it unusual seeing the, the masses of the Indian people in, in towns like Calcutta? Or oh, yes, yes. I mean, you, the people were just everywhere, the way they dressed. You, uh, one time in Calcutta, I went down to the burial place, and the burial place consists of, of uh, immolation. They burn the people. And uh, the more well-off you are, the more expensive the wood you use. And the rich people use sandalwood. And, uh, but they would they would build a pyre and place the body on it and set no fire. And this was down on the Ganges River. But that that was one of the things that I went to see in uh, Calcutta. 
Another thing I did in Calcutta, I went to the Anglican Church to see how they uh, mm -hmm. conducted a uh, service in, in India. It was the same as was it in, was it in uh, the it English in, language? Oh, yes, it was in English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, English was the official language there. The other thing that was interesting in Calcutta was the taxi cabs. They were all 28, 29, 30 open car Buicks and Oaklands, but uh, they'd managed to uh, keep them going. And, uh, you rode, rode in a long taxi cab. It had a uh, top that would let up and down cloth. Um, I often ask this. Do, were there heroes and villains in those days? Good guys and bad guys? I don't know whether we considered heroes and villains. Of course, you went to the movies and had <laughs> the heroes and villains there. And uh, of course, some of the people in the, some of the people that were your commanding officers and some of them were heroes and some of them were kind of skunks too. I just throw that out sometimes. Um, can you tell me anything else about uh, the popular culture or, or uh, the, the music or the, uh, um, anything you do while you were in uh, the, the base or, or, uh, or stateside? Was there anything uh, in particular about the, the music, the radio, or... Uh, Anything of course, you didn't, you didn't have the radios that you have now, and uh, I don't know that we had any. As I say, the movies were the main entertainment when we were in, in uh, India, and uh, as I say, sometimes you got to go to something if you went to town, went to Calcutta, you might get to go to something, or if you went to is it Shanghai, I can remember specifically going to two or three things. And uh, one thing about it, one of the theaters was a right long way from where we were stationed. And uh, you got there by rickshaw. And uh, in the daytime, that was fine. But coming home, I had a rickshaw man, and he brought me a certain far, a certain distance. And I think he decided, well, I'm going to be too far from my home. I'm going to put you out right here. So he put me out, and I wasn't home. But uh, somewhere I got another rickshaw to bring me home. You use cigarettes as uh, as uh, pay fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're willing to do things for cigarettes. Was the rickshaw in Shanghai? Rickshaw was in Shanghai. Was there any... There were, there were... No, there weren't rickshaws, I don't guess, in Calcutta. I can't remember. Is there anything else you can tell me about Shanghai? I've certainly never been there. Uh, let me see, what did we do? I've heard that early in the war, uh, there was actually a Jewish population of Shanghai? Russian. Yeah. It could have been Russian Jewish. Yeah. Uh -huh. so but there were lots of Russians were in Shanghai. And that's why I say you went to, to some of these Russian plays and Russian operas and uh, got, got to see them. One thing that was interesting uh, from uh, one of the bases in China, we were flown up to Tianjin. We didn't get to go to Beijing, but we got to go to Tianjin. And, uh, this was October after the war was over in September, and uh, they didn't quite know what the currency was. And uh, I bought a camera, and I used three different types of currencies that I had. I had some American money, I had some uh, Japanese money, that, the Chinese money, I mean, that uh, was of one kind, and Chinese money of another kind. But I could get up enough Chinese money to buy me a real good camera, and uh, used it for several years, and uh, I bought lots of little knickknacks that I brought home, and uh, we still have some of them. And, uh, so you were able to take photographs of Shanghai, actually? Uh-huh, yeah. Well, this was after war, I remember. Yeah, this was, this was October 45. And, uh, Not much afterwards. No. Um, was there anything you were particularly afraid of at the time? You know, I'm not sure that there was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you... you Felt, you felt that you were the United States and that you were all powerful and that you helped these people and uh, they were not going to hurt you. What's the first thing you did when you got mm, Ate supper, I'm sure. Celebrated Christmas. <laughs> Celebrated with food, yeah. 
Well, um, just as interested in speaking to um, members of your generation, I, I'm just as interested in some of your histories of the last 50 years. Can you give me an idea of your career, what you did in the, in the post-war era? Mm -hmm. Came to Athens and began, well, I had to finish my training. I did not have training as a pediatrician. I was only trained as an MD. And then I did two years residency, one in uh, Chattanooga and one in Augusta and Columbus. And uh, then after I'd finished my residency, I decided to set a practice in Athens and came to Athens in 1949. Met Caroline in 1950 and uh, married in 51. And uh, we have still been married. What, was your wife's, what is your wife's maiden name? Caroline Bennett. She, mm. she was from Gay, Georgia, and she taught English, freshman English, at the university. And uh, we had two children. We have two children, a boy, Charles, who is a CPA here in town, and a daughter, Betty, who is married to an ag engineer professor who lives in, and they live in uh, Davis, California. They have two children, who are three and five, uh, William three and Clara who's five. And where did you all live um, in those years? We've always what, lived. What, what neighborhood? I'm oh, oh, well we originally had a home on West Lake, had an apartment on West Lake. We bought a home on Oakland Way and lived there till 1958. Five, 1958, yeah. <laughs> and then from 1958 we built a new house in Glenwood and on Riverview and we've lived there 35, six years. And have you retired at, at some yes, point? Yes, I retired in 1987 and uh, spend my time now being a gardener and traveling and taking care of my wife and children. <laughs> oh, yes, I go to the university. Yeah, I've been to the university and audited oh, eight or ten really? different courses. Uh, of course, none of them do you take an examination for. But uh, I've had Chinese history, and I've had American history, and I've had American literature, and I've had economic history, mm -hmm. and I've had uh, three, four garden courses, one in trees, one in ornamental shrubs, one in herbaceous perennials. Uh, yeah, I took, oh, yeah, Greek mythology and Greek culture, and uh, all of these, all of these are really interesting because you could go and you could hear the teacher lecture, and uh, you didn't have to really study, right. but the, the things that you had not picked up as a medical student, and because you had too much time, spent too much time then with your medical work, and uh, undergraduate work there. But uh, I, I've, as I say, enjoyed this thoroughly. Do you get to talk to some of the other students in there? Do oh, yeah, you, you talk to some of the other students, yeah. I mean, interestingly enough, I go now to some of the uh, garden places, and all these students are so, <laughs> so happy to see me. Just, we had the same course, you remember? <laughs> I believe it. Um, and did your wife continue to teach after your marriage or not? No, not. Well, she taught one, she did have an episode of teaching a time when she taught foreign students English. Mm -hmm. and, it was a good uh, job. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was real interesting. It was not a job. Just it was a... At, at the Baptist students? Baptist Center. Baptist Center. Yes. Um, would you and like to, to um, uh, answer any, I mean, say anything about <laughs> that work or that, those, about uh, the World War II era, Mrs. Bonner? If you'll ask me some questions, I'll be to I May I? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'll certainly be glad to pin this back on you, but I'd love to. I, I, don't know I guess I'd just like to ask about where you were living in Gay, Georgia. I've, mm -hmm. uh, I've done some folklore work uh, in the Chattahoochee River Valley and gone up to Warm Springs and almost to Gay uh, for the Columbus Museum once. But uh, I guess I'm interested in hearing um, where you lived 50 years ago? Of course, during what sort the of family and what sort of the conditions you experienced. During the war, of course, I was not in gay except in the summertime. But the war had a profound effect on my life. In fact, that it's what governed my whole life because I had finished tenth college 
in 38. I had taught three years in northern North Florida. I had taught one year in Jefferson, which was my had been my daddy's hometown. And I had gone to visit in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And a friend said, why don't you go down and see if you can get a job here in Spartanburg? We're here, just come live in Spartanburg. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it, but I decided I would go. So I, I went down, interviewed the high school superintendent, thinking that if I had interviewed him, I wouldn't have to come back if he decided he wanted to hire me. But I got home, and as soon as he didn't hire me then, and as soon as I got home, he called and asked me to come back because he apparently didn't remember that he'd interviewed me. But anyway, he wanted me to come back, so I turned right around and went back and got the job in Spartanburg because one of his English teachers had been drafted. And so I taught in Spartanburg for four years. Then uh, I came back to the university, came to the University of Georgia to go back to school and got a master's in English here. Well, by that time the war was over. So I don't know, but probably my teacher wanted his job back. But anyway, the university was filling up with students. Mm -hmm. And I said almost anybody who could speak English could be allowed to teach English. So I, as I finished my master's, I stayed on. In fact, I started doing some teaching before I finished because they needed teachers that badly. And I taught English at the university four years and uh, then married Bill and I've been here ever since. But during the war years, I was in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Well, it sounds as if teaching at the university, you probably had some freshman composition students on the GI Bill. On my, oh, my yes, phone. yes, yes. But uh, I was in Jefferson when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. That, sun, that Sunday afternoon, I was out walking. Some, other, some of the other teachers and I had walked down behind the high school and around and came back. And when we got back, they greeted us with, with that news. But um, as I say, then since there was a war, I changed schools. Of course, that was also the year in Jefferson that the war broke out and the school building burned down. So between the two, I was about ready to leave anyway. Do you recall but, uh, VE Day and VJ Day? Uh, to a certain extent, I, I sometimes get them mixed up. I was not, I was not in Spartanburg. I think I was in Augusta with my sisters. I had, I have two sisters, and they both worked in Augusta. One of them worked at the Augusta Arsenal, and one of them worked at the um, hospital there that was the medical Veterans hospital, Veterans, Veterans hospital. hospital in Augusta. And I, I think, if I'm correct, I think I was there both times, spending the weekends with them. Um, what did your parents do? Did you have brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, my father was a uh, country doctor. My mother was a school teacher. And they both went to Gay as people not native to the community. And they married and stayed in Gay until 1970-something, when they moved to Athens to be um, up here because we were living up here. Mm -hmm. My daddy practiced medicine in the country for 64 years. Um, they died in 94 and 93. I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> And brothers and sisters, did you have Those two any? sisters, the one, one who worked at the Augusta Hospital and one who at the Veterans Hospital during the war. Well, of those students at the university after World War II, was there any difference in the, the, the um, study habits of the, the students who were the normal college age and the students who were a few years older and had been to the Army? I don't know. I had taught school in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where I had some excellent students. And uh, my students in Spartanburg could read and write. And when I came to the University of Georgia and started teaching the freshman class, I was appalled. 
at the students, at the number of students who could not really read and write. Unfortunately, I think that's often the case these days. Um, I tend to wind up these interviews with uh, a, a thought question. I'll, I'll ask you and then I'll, I'll give it back to your husband. Um, I, I tend to ask um, if you're speaking to younger people about that era and uh, the experiences of 50 years ago. Is there something you think is most important that, that people who only know this through history or even videotapes, that people, um, is there something you think that's most important most to remember important. from that time? Because I guess one of the most important thing, impressions that I get about the whole time thinking about and looking on it is how completely the country um, put itself into the war effort and everything stopped unless it had something to do with uh, carrying on the war or making making the, making the war progress. I believe you. Um, let me unclip you for a moment and thanks for speaking with me. Um, and I'd like to ask you the same question, sir. What do you think is most important to remember from that time? If you give me a moment, I'll turn the camera back on There we are. The thoughts and the actions at that time, I think, were more focused in the way that things were done than they are now. Certainly, at the present time, everyone seems to show a little more greed, a little bit more gimme. Uh, idea than they did at that time and uh, certainly it's interesting to compare the uh, value of things at that time with the value of things at this time and uh, how you paid 10 cents for a pound of grapes that now cost you a dollar and 50 cents. I mean, we had grapes for lunch and that was one thing I thought about <laughs> at lunch. These are white Thompson seedless grape, and uh, of course cigarettes, I think, uh, 15 cents a pack now, and I don't know what they are then, but I don't know what they are now. But it's the 150% thing applies there oh, as well. Yeah, but, yeah. but uh, fortunately, fortunately, you do not see the number of people that smoke anymore that you saw back at that time, and uh, it has come to the uh, forefront that cigarettes are certainly a detriment to civilization. I, I rarely get the chance to ask this question, but did, did any doctors discuss the addictive qualities of tobacco when everyone was smoking them? Uh, yes. I mean, I can remember the first times that I heard about the problems of cigarettes and uh, Dr. Alton Oxner, one of the great surgeons of uh, Tulane University, was the one that brought up the problems of cigarettes in the 50s. and. Uh, it was not until the 60s that the Surgeon General's report came out, and that was the first one in 1963, I think. And interestingly enough, I stopped smoking a week before that report came out because I knew what the report was going to say, and if I had stopped, then I could feel a little bit better about it. And I have not, I have not smoked since then. Um, well, I. Um I've enjoyed listening to some of your experiences. Um, uh, I've spoken to some other folks in the China, Burma, India theater, but it seems to me such an exotic place in some ways. Um, um, is there anything else you can tell me before I cut the... Uh, the uh, well, it was yeah. nice to be there at, when I was there. I would not want to go back. Uh, it, it, uh, I'd rather go to Europe. I've been to Europe many times and uh, did not get to go to Europe in, during the war. But uh, I, I, as I say, I'm not looking forward to going back to the to the uh, China Burma India theater. I understand. Well, thank you very much for coming and spending thank some you. time. Thank you. Thank you. Hope hope we've been helpful. You very much.